for those of you joining, we're just going to give it a couple of minutes. Let um, let uh, everyone get in and get settled, and then we'll we'll get going. In. <clears throat> okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in today's webinar. Um, uh, my name is Guy Stokeford. I'm Head of Consultancy Services at Procurement for Housing, and I will be chairing the session today. Um, we've got one of our favourite speakers back who joined us earlier in the year at PFH Live. So we know she's good, and we know this is going to be a good presentation. Um, so uh, welcome to Angela. She is the Assistant Director of Consumer Regulation at the Regulator for Social Housing. Um, she's responsible for managing the regulator's current reactive consumer regulation function, God, that's a mouthful, um, and supporting the implementation of social housing white paper. So um, really important role. And uh, today's session is quite clearly about consumer regulation now and in the future. So Anne's just gonna to talk to us about the current approach to consumer regulation, what registered providers um, should be doing now, lessons learned from their casework, um, and then the session is going to look at the changes that the uh, regulator is making to consumer regulation and how landlords can best prepare to implement those changes. So I think it's going to be a really useful presentation um, for, for you guys, and hopefully you get a lot out of it. Just in terms of kind of housekeeping for the session, we are recording it. Um, so if there's bits you miss or um, you don't get your questions asked and answered during the session, then um, we will send that round um, shortly after. Um, and just going to talk to us for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll have hopefully 15 minutes at the end for questions. So there is a Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. So throughout the presentation, please do feel free to drop your questions in there or ask them at the end, um, and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, uh, and as I say, um, if you've registered, you'll get the presentation. Um, and I think it's um, just on me to say thanks very much for joining and um, for me to hand over to Angela and um, let's get, get started. Thank you, Guy. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and thank you for inviting me to come and talk to, to you all today. I think this is a really critical time for the sector, for us as a regulator as well. And so what we're trying to do um, through this session and through other sessions that we're having is really talk to people who work in the sector who will be responsible for delivering the changes sort of on the ground and make sure people know what's coming, what our role as regulator will be um, and what you can do now to prepare. Um, I'll talk a little bit in, in the future, in later in the session about what, what's coming next and what's coming down, down the track. Uh, but I wanted to start with a brief overview, really, of our, our current role uh, and what we currently do. So when Guy was introducing me, he said that I manage our reactive consumer regulation function, really just to explain what that means in practice um, and a little bit more about how we do our current consumer regulation work. And then I think we'll move on to talk about what we learn through that consumer regulation casework. You know, we deal with a lot of cases um, on, a, on a week to week and year to year basis. So I'll talk a little bit about what we learn from that and what providers can learn, what you can hopefully take away and think about in your in your own organisations. Then I'll talk about that white paper, uh, the social housing white paper and what it means for consumer regulation in the future. So things will change, things will change for you as providers, um, things will change for hopefully for your tenants as well as a result of that, and it'll change how we regulate as well. So I'll talk a little bit about what you can expect and some broad hints and tips really on, on how the sector can prepare. Um, we, the 
the consumer regulation, uh, the new consumer regulation process will go live on the 1st of April 2024, which in one way feels like a long way off, but I suspect won't actually feel very long given what people need to do to prepare, certainly for us as regulator, what we need to do to prepare, but what you can do and what you can be doing now to prepare as well. And as Guy said, we'll have some time at the end for questions and discussion. And I think hopefully there'll be a lot of value in that in understanding your positions, understanding where you're coming from, what else we might be able to provide, what other information we might need to put out into the public domain as well. So just a little bit about our current role, um, in, particularly with regards to consumer regulation. So the first bullet point on that slide talks about is, is really our strap line. It's, what we, it's how we describe what we do. So we exist to regulate registered providers of social housing to promote a viable, efficient and well-governed social housing sector. And I think it becomes pretty clear from that, that our focus at the minute is on economic regulation. So it's about making sure that registered providers are well-governed, well-run, uh, and that they are financially viable and that they in order to do they do that in order to be able to provide the homes that people need our focus is primarily um economic regulation at the minute it is the main part of what we do as a regulator it's most where most of our staff sit is in doing our economic regulation uh, through a series of planned assessments um, of large providers so we engage with the sector um on a program of work where we will come out and we will do planned assessments. You might hear them called in-depth assessments, but that's where we come out and we will assess um, the quality of a provider's governance. Are they financially viable? Are they achieving good value for money? Uh, and are their rents set in the right way? Um, and, and are they charging the right rents to their tenants? And that is the main focus of our work. I think that strap line um, is probably going to need to be updated. I, I don't think I'm betraying any, any secrets there when I say the focus on economic regulation is going to shift. Um, that doesn't mean that we will do less economic regulation, far from it. Um, but actually, what we're also going to do is do more consumer regulation uh, and increase, you know, really bring parity between our consumer regulation and our economic regulation that we already do. Um, so in terms of consumer regulation, what we currently do is to operate on a reactive basis. So we don't have those planned series of assessments in the same way that we do for our economic regulation. Uh, instead, we operate on a reactive basis. So we get information sent through to us uh, from a vast range of, of sources, from tenants, their representatives, um, including uh, people like MPs and councillors. Uh, we get registered providers and local authorities making what we would call a self-referral to us. Uh, and we get them from a range of other sources as well. And we get that information and we look at what does this tell us about an organization's compliance with our consumer standards? So what does it tell us about how safe tenants are in their homes? Um, are they given appropriate choice and degree of choice and protection? Can they hold their landlords to account? And obviously we'll have all seen in, in the press over the last week or so, um, the case of Awabi Shack um, and you know, the really significant events that happened at Rochdale Borough Wide Housing that led to, to his death. Um, it really brings into focus the importance of landlords getting this right, protecting their tenants, doing the right things for their tenants, being able to hear their voices. Um, that's something that we're really keen on and really focused on in our consumer regulation. Um, and we will be aiming to do more of that um, in the future when, we, when our role changes. But for now, our role, as I said, in consumer regulation is reactive. Um, it's, we have a high bar for consumer regulation for us to be able to take regulatory action at this point. We focus on what we would describe as potential systemic issues. Um, and we also have the serious detriment test in place at the minute, although that is being removed if the bill is going through Parliament to remove that. What that means is we don't intervene in a lot of consumer regulation cases that make their way to us at the minute. Uh, instead, what we're looking for is, does an organisation have the right systems and processes in place to deliver a compliant outcome or what we would deem to be a compliant outcome? We do know that sometimes things can go wrong in individual properties. Uh, sometimes tenants make complaints that are very well founded. Uh, it's not our role to resolve those complaints. Uh, we don't have a role there. Um, what we, we do receive those kinds of complaints on occasion, so, and we will always signpost those individuals to the housing ombudsman who does have a role um, in investigating those individual complaints and trying to seek a resolution. But for us, when we receive that information, what we're looking at is, are the presenting issues that are brought to us, could that be a breach of our standards? So does it demonstrate a wider failure 
um, within the organization to have systems or processes in place um, that would deliver compliant outcome or does whatever went wrong in that individual case could that happen to lots of people um, lots of other tenants in their homes that kind of thing so we're always testing what does this information tell us about whether there's been a breach of our standards uh, and therefore do we have a role in intervening so just looking back at our casework from last year so and the reason I'm focused on the last year is because the information is publicly available and you can access it through our consumer regulation review we published it in September of this year so it's available on our website um, it really is a backwards look through 2021-22 casework um, we'll, we'll publish another one um, next year with, with more up-to-date casework, obviously. Um, it's an annual publication. But briefly, last year, we had 650 referrals that on our consumer regulation side. Um, as I said, they did come from a wide range of stakeholders. Most common is tenants who live in social housing um, or directly from registered providers themselves. Um, but we also got things from elected representatives, um, from the media. Uh, there was an awful lot, obviously, of media retention last year with the ITN investigations, um, from other sources, from tribunal services, from the housing ombudsman, that kind of thing. So we take all of those referrals in. We've got a three-stage process, so all of those referrals are considered. Um, at, the, at the first stage, we always have an initial review of them. We considered just under half of those in detail, so at what we would describe as our consumer regulation panel, but really that is a detailed assessment of what does this information tell us, could it be a breach of the standard, um, and we looked at three around 300 cases through that process. And we investigated, of those 300, we investigated half of those, so about 150 investigations, which is where we would engage with a range of stakeholders depending on, on the presenting issues. Almost inevitably, we would engage with the landlord, um, I think it's fair to say, but we'd also engage with whoever brought that referral to us. You know, Have they got more information that they could share with us? Um, have they got evidence that they want us to consider? Uh, so we do about 150 investigations. Those numbers for last year are slightly up on previous years, um, and I think sort of points to us an upward trend, but a slow upward trend. So they are slightly up, and year on year, we are sort of getting more and more referrals. And again, we're we're about on track for 650, 670 or something um, this year as well. So numbers are increasing, but slowly. Last year, we found a breach of our consumer standards and serious detriment in eight cases. Um, that was up from one the year before. I don't think that suggests that things are getting worse necessarily in social housing, that increasing number. Instead, I think what it shows is a greater awareness of our role. Um, we did some flexing of our approach during COVID as well. You know, obviously landlords had a very difficult uh, position to deal with during the, the pandemic. Um, but coming out of that pandemic and how providers manage their situations there um, is probably what's led to that increase in cases. Nevertheless, eight cases is, is a low proportion of what we get. Um, as I said, so eight cases out of 650. But I think really that speaks to that difference between us not looking at individual issues, but looking at where there are systemic failures uh, within an organization. Primarily where we found a breach decision, it relates to issues around our home standard. Um, that is the most common uh, set of referrals that we get, about half of our referrals, relates to the home standard about quality of homes, repairs, statutory health and safety compliance. Um, and every decision that we made last year, all of those breach decisions last year, the eight of them, all involve the home standard in one way or another. So um, issues around the quality of accommodation, the decency of the homes provided to tenants, uh, compliance with health and safety law as well continues to be a really big part of our work. The other area where we found a breach last year in one case was the tenant involvement and empowerment standard. So really this standard is about how landlords engage with their tenants, um, how they hear the voices that tenant, uh, of their tenants, how they deal with complaints, uh, that kind of thing. And the one case, and I'll talk about it uh, later in the slides, uh, was about how a landlord heard the voice of their tenants. And there was tenants telling their landlord, we have a problem, there is a problem with the quality of accommodation that you're providing, um, and how the landlord dealt with those um, was, was what led to the breach of that standard. We have found a breach of that standard in the past, but it is less common than the home standard. Um, again, I think that probably speaks to the presence of the serious detriment test being in place. It's easier for us to evidence harm or potential harm to tenants 
for things like the home standard, given the quality of accommodation or if health and safety uh, requirements aren't met. But nevertheless, you know, it is possible for tenants to be harmed by poor tenant engagement and poor tenant involvement. Um, and I think we'll see more of that, obviously, as we move, as the serious detriment test is removed and as we deal with uh, more referrals around how landlords are engaging with their tenants. Uh, about one third of the referrals that we get relate to landlords' um, engagement with tenants and complaints handling. So it does continue to be a really significant issue for landlords and for the sector overall. So just some key lessons from our casework um, that I thought were worth sharing. Um, the first one is about good governance and leadership and the role that that plays in delivering really good quality services for tenants. I think one of the things that we have seen um, through our casework over the last year is often the issues are identified, um, you, you know, where there have been failings, those issues are identified uh, through new leadership um, or through a change in leadership where providers start looking and thinking, well, are we really sure that we're delivering the right outcomes for our tenants and really testing the evidence and assurance that they can get on that? So I think, you know, setting the right culture, delivering the right, um, the right system or criteria for uh, people within your organisations to raise issues. So if your staff on the ground are seeing that there are problems, you know, really delivering that cultural change where it's safe for those to speak up um, and for them to to make sure that issues are raised at an earlier stage before um, before the situation gets worse. Uh, the second lesson is around effective engagement with tenants, um, not only because it's a good thing in itself, because it absolutely is, but uh, and because it will help you to hear uh, what services are like on the ground. Um, tenants are a great indicator of what services are like on the ground and how they receive your services. So, you know, we've seen cases where possibly some of the metrics that you've got around repairs and things like that are pretty reasonable. But actually, if you speak to tenants and you hear those messages that tenants are giving you, they might tell a different story, not in every case, but they might tell a different story. So making sure that you've got good engagement with your tenants is really critical. And I think for the future with changes to our regulation and, and proactive consumer regulation, which is what we're moving towards, will be more important at that point in helping landlords to prepare for that and delivering that cultural shift that allows tenants to hold their landlords to account. The third lesson for us is about the good quality, uh, providing good quality accommodation and accommodation that is safe and well managed. Um, I talked earlier about the Rochdale Borough Wide Housing case. It's not just that provider, though, where we've seen poor quality accommodation um, or where landlords need to do more to make sure that their accommodation is safe and well managed. You know, we've got uh, the breach cases from last year, those eight cases, all relating either to quality of accommodation or compliance with statutory health and safety accommodation. And it really is the most fundamental responsibility of any landlord, I think, to make sure that tenants are safe in their in the homes that they live in. I think underpinning that is the need for reliable data and good oversight of what your services are delivering. Uh, reliable data really is the cornerstone of any kind of assurance that you can get. And when we see things going wrong in our casework, often the data is underpinning it is poor. So often you see that landlords start digging into their data and they uh, having thought that their data was good previously, but you start looking at it and you think, it's maybe not as good quality or as reliable as we would have thought, um, or it's not in the format that we need, or it's stored in multiple different spreadsheets. And actually those spreadsheets perhaps don't talk to each other uh, and don't give you that oversight that you need. Um, we see that particularly in relation to statutory health and safety compliance, but also in relation to repairs, um, who's living in your properties, what their needs are as well. Um, you know, do they have uh, particular needs do they need aids and adaptations are there things that you can be helping with as a landlord to make sure that they are living in their homes in a safe way um, so really making sure that you understand your tenants and what they need and your homes and what they need is really really critical and having real confidence in that data will set you in good stead for the future and the final lesson which which may be relevant to some people on the call is about the role of local authorities and they, that they have to comply with our consumer standards. That might not be news to some of you, but I can tell you from our experience through our casework, it is news to some local authorities that they are regulated by us on the consumer standards. So we don't look at local authorities' governance or their financial viability, but we do look at the services that they provide to tenants. 
um, and the quality of accommodation and we'll continue to do that. The work with local authorities is becoming an increasing part of our consumer standard work at the minute. Um, when we move to do proactive consumer regulation, that will include assessments and inspections of local authorities as well as private registered providers. So there's work for local authorities to do there as well. So just thinking about the white paper then and, and what is happening. Um, white paper published two years ago now, um, which feels like a very long time and, and also no time at all, um, but really important change for the sector and for the regulator as well. The main thing for us is, you know, we were really pleased to be asked by government to do um, and, and to increase our consumer regulation work and that the our consumer regulation work will be co-located with our economic regulation work. We think it's really important because it gives us a really good rounded view of a provider. You know, we want good services to be provided, but an organisation can't do that if they're not well run or if they're not financially viable. So what we want is for landlords to be delivering good services for their tenants, for them to do that in a way that means that they uh, can demonstrate the impact that they're having for their tenants, that they have confidence in, in the services that they're delivering and that they remain financially viable while they do that. So the intention is not, as I said earlier, to diminish our economic regulation in any way. It's to bring our consumer regulation up to a par with that and to make sure that we are looking at providers um, in the round, looking at their services and what they, how they are run in the round. I think for that reason, good governance remains imperative. So we will look at that through our economic regulation work, but making sure that you're really well run um, will really stand you in better stead for delivering good quality outcomes for your tenants. And for private registered providers where we do look at good governance, um, where we see something going wrong on the consumer side, there is almost always a failure of governance. When you get onto the skin of what happened and what went wrong in that case, there's almost always something that relates to their governance uh, that could be strengthened, that could be better. Um, so really making sure that your governance arrangements work, uh, that they deliver good outcomes will remain imperative and we'll always be interested in that. The main thing for us is um, in terms of how we regulate is being co-regulatory and outcome focused. Co-regulatory means that we will work with the sector uh, and what we don't want to do is have some sort of tick box exercise around what landlords should be doing. Instead, what we want is for landlords to really understand what good looks like and what services to tenants should look like uh, and then for you to deliver that and for your boards and, and local authority councillors to have assurance and evidence that you're delivering those outcomes. We will come and assess that. So we will come and, and do our assessments and inspections. But what we want to see is that you've got what you need to assess and hold your teams to account. And then to make sure that if something is going wrong, that you're able to pick that up at an early stage and deal with it. Um, and the outcome focus really is that speaks to that no tick boxes um, approach. What we want is for you to look at what is being delivered on the ground for your tenants. And if something's going wrong, have you got the right systems in place to put things right? which all speaks to a lot of responsibility for landlords. You know, you already bear a lot of responsibility in making sure that you provide good quality homes for your tenants. Um, that will remain the same. So it will remain your responsibility to do all of the good things that you already do uh, and make sure that you are providing what tenants need and, and sharing with us if, if you're not meeting those standards. We recognise that this is a difficult time, that there's a lot of pressure on the sector um, you know, pressure on finances, um, lots of competing uh, requirements for you as landlords as well. Um, and it's right that you will have to make some decisions around that and you will have to decide where you invest, where you spend your resources. Um, and there will always be trade offs because no organisation can do everything. So we do recognise that. But instead, what we want to see is good decision making around it, a good understanding of what those trade offs are. Uh, you've been able to articulate why you're doing certain things, how that aligns with your strategy, how you've talked to tenants about that and how you've explained that to your tenants as well. So they're aware of what your priorities are and your priorities are informed by what really matters to tenants on the ground. But there are lots of things that are changing um, through the consumer regulation uh, work and the delivery of the social housing white paper. Um, some things are happening within government and within uh, parliament as well. So we will be given new objectives, new powers, and a new function. So that new function is a consumer regulation function. We are, will have new objectives uh, set by parliament for us. At the minute, we have an economic objective and a consumer objective. That consumer objective covers all of the things that we've already talked about today. So things like 
um, whether people, providers provide good quality accommodation, do our tenants adequately protected, but we'll have new objectives that specifically relate to safety. Uh, so our tenants safe in their homes and a new objective around transparency as well. So our landlords being transparent with their tenants. We'll also have new powers to enforce against local authorities and private registered providers if they're not delivering the right outcomes. In practice, we use those powers really infrequently um, because most providers, most landlords want to do the right thing for their tenants. Um, so we use that. We don't really need to use them in the vast majority of cases. And even when things go wrong, we are usually able to work really well with providers to put things right for their tenants. So it really matters um, having those powers um, so that we can focus our attention really on, on where we can't drive change through other means. I've talked a lot so far today about proactive consumer regulation. Um, really, uh, as I've said before, what that means is that we will be doing inspections and assessments of providers. We'll go in and we'll under seek to understand what services are like on the ground for tenants, what you're doing, how you engage with your tenants um, and how they receive your services, I think is, is probably a good way of putting it. I think it's our intention that for private registered providers, we will do that alongside our economic assessments of, of providers to, as I said, to try and get that really rounded picture. Uh, but we will try and make sure that we do that um, in a sensible and measured way um, for, for local authorities as well, but that will give us an accurate position for how providers are, are performing. The serious detriment test will be removed, which will remove some of the barriers for us taking action against providers if we need to. Um, there will be tenant satisfaction measures brought in. Um, you'll hear them called TSMs as well. So, um, and I'm sure you've seen our consultation. But the TSMs we consulted on at the start of this year, uh, and we published our decision statement in September. Those TSMs, unlike the rest of consumer regulation that goes live in 2024, the TSMs go live from April 23, so just over five months now from now. And I think the important thing for that is because it will take providers the year, so 2023 to 24, to gather their data to make sure that they've got a year's worth of data that they can share with the regulator and, and with other stakeholders as well. And we think tenant satisfaction measures are a really critical um, development for the sector. And we were delighted when we consulted, we got more than 1100 responses and more than half of those were from tenants and the rest being from other stakeholders, primarily the sector. Um, but it's really important to have those measures. I know lots of landlords do their own tenant satisfaction uh, surveys and things like that already, but what this will do will give some comparability across how landlords are performing. So for us as a regulator, that will allow us to understand where are the risk to tenants, where are we better focusing our interventions, uh, what can we do to, to make sure that we are picking up on the biggest risk areas for, for tenants and for landlords. But it's also a really helpful way for tenants to understand how their landlord is performing and how that compares across others um, in order to hold their landlords to account. And we think it will be a really helpful tool as well for landlords to understand where they sit as well, because I think it will help you identify with your tenants areas where you might want to focus your attention and your resources uh, and make sure that you are tackling those areas, maybe where satisfaction is a bit lower or where there's more you can do to drive up improvements in your services at that point. The other area that's changing is our consumer standards. So our consumer standards have been in place from, I think it's 2010. So they are um, a little bit old now uh, and definitely in need of a refresh. The white paper asked us to refresh our consumer standards. Um, there is a lot of good stuff in those consumer standards already. And what we don't want to do is throw out all of that good stuff um, that we're already asking landlords to do. But they will be refreshed and our intention is really to make sure that we are um, setting standards that will matter for tenants and, and are the things that matter to tenants and the things that landlords can be reasonably expected to deliver for their tenants. Um, we've had a lot of sessions um, already talking to tenants about it, um, about what they think should be in those standards and about how we should measure it. We've also done some conversations with landlords about that. Uh, and we will move to consult on our consumer standards in the not too distant future. So we are working up what we think um, should be in those standards, removing some of the language that's maybe a bit old or outdated, um, putting in new things that um, 
are, are based on what the government is asking of us to do. And we will do a wide scale consultation on that um, next year. It will be, I think, to the spring of next year, I think, is our intention. But what we really want is for lots of responses in the same way that we got lots of responses on the tenant satisfaction measures, because getting those responses and getting that feedback will really make those standards something that um, are useful and usable for, for the sector and for tenants as well. There are also going to be some changes around nominated individuals. Some of this is coming through the legislation which is passing through Parliament now. So landlords will have to have a nominated individual who is responsible for safety and making sure that tenants are safe in their homes. What we don't want to do is diminish the responsibility of everybody who is accountable within an organisation for that. But there should be a single person um, under the legislation. There should be a single person who will be responsible and who will have to work across the organisation to make sure that that safe outcomes are delivered. Um, and this isn't legislative, but there will also be a requirement to have a nominated individual for compliance with the consumer standards as well. So, again, who's responsible for that in your organisation? Who's responsible for driving up those standards? Um, and who can tenants and us as regulator come and talk to uh, when we need to about compliance with the consumer standards. The other changes just at the bottom of the slide are really around access to information. So the intention is to give um, tenants of private registered providers access to the same sorts of information uh, through something akin to a Freedom of Information Act uh, that applies to local authorities. So being able, uh, those tenants being able to ask for information and receive information about how their landlord is performing uh, will be really important in future. Uh, the other changes that are coming is changes to the decent home standard. We've heard an awful lot about that in recent weeks, um, but the decent home standard is, is currently in place, but is being reviewed by the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Um, we don't set that standard. It is the department who do it, but we regulate against it. So we will get that standard from the government when it comes through um, and we'll regulate against it to make sure that landlords provide homes of the right standard for uh, for their tenants and the final area because i'm conscious that there is a lot of changes happening outside of the regulator as well with the building safety regulator being introduced and also increased powers for the housing ombudsman is making sure that we are working in a joined up way with those organizations to make sure that that system is clear the system where tenants can go is clear how we can resolve complaints that things don't fall between the gaps of our organizations so we will do more work on that um, and I think you would expect to see memorandum of understandings with both of those, those organisations being published in future. So coming to the end then, really, what should the sector be doing now to prepare for, for the changes that are coming? Uh, I've talked about most of these things, hopefully, through the presentation, but just some pointers and some things that you would want to think about, I'm sure. Uh, the first thing is about listening and understanding to your tenants. Um, you know, we continue to hear stories where tenants say that they don't feel listened to, that they struggle to get a response from their landlord, that they struggle to navigate through a complaint system, that kind of thing. Uh, so making sure that you have those systems is really important and making sure that tenants can access and navigate through those systems will be really critical. Um, I think for us, when we see things going wrong, you know, often tenants on the ground have known um, that the services that they've been receiving haven't been right. Um, they've, they're a really good indicator, as I said earlier, a really good indicator of what the services are like on the ground. And actually, if you've got those mechanisms to hear what tenants are saying and to have your tenants hold you to account, it can help you to identify issues at an early stage before they grow into something that becomes a more significant problem. So being able to hear those messages and responding um, promptly and effectively is really helpful. And I've spoken a little bit during this presentation about that cultural shift and making sure that you can hear the voices of your tenants. Uh, that is something that we'll really be focused on when we come and do our assessments as well. So uh, lots of landlords have, have different mechanisms. We, we don't prescribe a certain mechanism for how you should do it. We want landlords to be able to decide how they do it because they know their tenants best and they will through talking to their tenants, they will understand what their tenants' preferences and needs are and how you can get the best from that and how you get the best feedback through that. So thinking about that now, you know, start thinking about are your mechanisms that you have now, are they fit for the future? Do they give you what you need culturally? Um, does it give you the right outcomes? Um, are you hearing those tenant voices at all levels in your organisation? So I don't just mean people delivering 
um, housing management services and services on the ground, but up through uh, your senior management teams, your board, do they understand that they're getting feedback from tenant complaints and knowing where to focus their attention, where there are risks. Um, so making sure that you've got that right will be really, really important. The second area that I wanted to talk about was about data uh, and, and particularly data in relation to your housing stock. Um, I talked earlier about the importance of having good quality data. I still see, um, I've been doing this job a long time now, and I still see cases where landlords come to us and say, I can't tell you that we comply because I don't know how many homes we own, or I don't know how many homes need a gas safety check or a fire risk assessment. And you think sometimes that the sector has got this nailed, but it's only when you start digging into that data that you think, well, perhaps not. And we've had some cases over the last year where providers have been reporting 100% compliance on things like statutory health and safety, but when they've been maybe externally audited or they've really tested their data, they can't evidence that all of their assets need or don't need um, those statutory checks. So making sure that your data is really clear, is really robust, is up to date, um, you know, and that speaks to things like good stock condition surveys and making sure that you've got an accurate picture of your stock and the quality of that stock and what it needs and when it needs that investment. So the investment obviously should be planned for uh, certainly big things, kitchens, bathrooms, component parts, roofing, boilers, all of those things will need investment and that will need planning for. And I know lots of the sector already does an awful lot of good work in that, but we do still see some cases where data is cloned, perhaps data is really old, there's not been a stock condition survey for 15 or 20 years, that kind of thing. You know, So really making sure that your data is good and that it gives you what you need in order to make good decisions about your stock and for your tenants as well will be really important. The third area is about transparency, accountability and safety. And within this, I suppose one of the things that I'd focus on is making sure that you're coming and engaging with us as the regulator. Um, we do see things that go wrong. We see an awful lot of cases, though, where something has gone wrong, but it's not a breach of our standard. We would rather know about those things um, that you come and talk to us about it. And then we can take a view on whether we have a role to intervene, whether it's necessary for us to intervene. And I think one of the things that gives us confidence, actually, in the landlord and their ability to deal with things is if you are transparent with us. So come and talk to us about it. Um, that doesn't mean that we won't or ever find a breach of standard. You know, we, we might do, depending on what the substance is. But it does give us confidence that you can deal with it and that it probably precludes us from needing to deal with um, powers or, you know, enforcing against something if we don't need to do that. If we think that you have a good understanding of the issue, um, that you understand our role as a regulator within that as well, um, will be really important for us in, in allowing you to get on and, and fix the problem um, on the ground. I think sometimes where we've seen things sort of be covered up in the hope that nobody will find out about it or in the hope that something will go away, actually that, that it speaks to cultural issues within organisations, but often those things sort of bubble away under the surface until they become a bigger problem. So, um, you know, understanding where you where you are, you know, an honest look at where you are and are there things that you should be talking to your tenants about? Are there things that you could be doing better? Um, are there things that you should be talking to us as the regulator about? I think it's probably better to do that sooner rather than later. And the final thing I would say is keep doing the good stuff. I talked earlier about the pressures that landlords are facing, all of the competing pressures and competing responsibilities that you have. You know, we do know that this is a difficult job. We know it's a difficult environment for you to operate in at the minute. Um, so and lots of landlords do lots and lots of good stuff and are really doing those things for the right reasons. So making sure that your tenants are safe in their homes, are delivering quite innovative things about how to engage with tenants, um, delivering great things within the communities in which they operate. So I think really worth you being aware of, of where you add value as a landlord, uh, what your purpose is, what, where your strengths are and what you're delivering for your tenants. Because I think that it helps for you to explain why you're here and what you're doing, but it also shows the real value that social housing can have, um, not just within the sector, but more widely as well so keep doing that good stuff and be aware of where you are doing good stuff I think will be really important now and in the future as well and that's me for for the presentation but we have got time for questions um but yeah just to say thank you again for for inv inviting us I hope it's been helpful uh, and really help happy to keep having that conversation thanks Angela um yeah 
really, really useful um, presentation, I think, for people there. Um, just a reminder, there is a QA and a option down the bottom. So if you do want to post any questions, please do. Yeah, we've got um, we've got a few minutes left for questions. So um, while, while we're waiting, um, I think really one of the things that sort of struck me is um, when is this going to all happen, uh, Angela? When should people be kind of gearing up for? Yeah, so a good question, I think, and it will happen in a few different phases. So I'll just talk you through through where they are. So I talked earlier about tenant satisfaction measures. They go live from 1st of April next year, 2023. Um, that is to, in order to give organisations the, the opportunity to have a year's worth of data to present to us. And we will be asking landlords to submit their data to us from April 2024. That's when our consumer regulation program will go live, is anticipated to go live. And what we mean by that is going on the ground and starting those inspections, um, those consumer inspections of local authorities and private registered providers as well. Um, and we'll use the TSM data, we'll use other information that we get through our evidence gathering, our intelligence gathering with providers as well. Um, there will there might be some other bits to follow depending on progress of things like legislation and other reviews. So things like um, electrical safety requirements, things that are going through in the reg renters reform bill as well. So there might be some things that change slightly afterwards, but we're expecting the big thing to start from April 24. We're really encouraging landlords to start now though and start gearing up now. We are gearing up for that now. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, we are recruiting staff. We want uh, people with good skills, good experience within our organization as well, but it's for landlords to start that work now because these things do take time to get right um, and what we don't want is the sector to be set up to fail we want landlords to do a good job um, so making sure that you're looking at it now I think will be really important for for, the, for when it does go live in 2024. Great thank you and you, you mentioned um, those those proactive inspections that you're doing what um, what can people expect from those what's what what's that going to look like for um, social landlords yeah, so we're doing some work at the minute to pilot and test um, what we think it will look like. So I've not got a fully formed answer, but I've got a reason <laughs> yeah. of what we think it will look like. Um, although that will depend on the outcomes of the testing and the piloting that we're doing. Yeah. Um, we anticipate it will cover two broad areas. So for those on the call who are familiar with our in-depth assessment, our in-depth assessment on the economic side covers five areas, which are things like structure, strategy, um, governance, financial viability, value for money. Yeah. We're anticipating adding two elements to it for our consumer standards. Um, one is around service outcomes um, and one is around accountability. So service outcomes is really, as it says on the tin, is intended mm. to be what services are being delivered on the ground for tenants. So we think it will cover things like decency, quality of homes, statutory health and safety, um, work that you do within your neighbourhoods, um, things like how you manage antisocial behaviour. Uh, we all have an increased role in working with landlords around domestic violence as well. So really thinking about those on the ground services that are delivered for tenants on the ground. The other area then around accountability is all of the stuff around how you engage with your tenants. Um, I've talked a lot about hearing your tenants voice during the presentation, but really making sure that you understand who your tenants are uh, think about how you engage with them. It will cover things like complaints handling, um, understanding your tenants' diverse needs and how you factor that into the, your service delivery as well. So if you're seeing sort of differential rates of satisfaction in certain groups of your tenants, you know, are you aware of that? Are you thinking about how to deliver better quality of services for, for those groups? Um, all of the things about tenant involvement in decision making, um, that kind of thing. So they're two quite broad areas that we'll cover um, and that's our anticipation is that those are the things that we'll cover um, for local authorities where we don't have that wider remit around governance and viability. It will just be those two areas that we're anticipating looking at, um, although we are, as I say, we're testing at the minute. So we'll see um, if there are any changes needed for that. Okay. Thanks. Um, and just just the last one from me in, in lieu of any other questions. Talk, as you just said, you talked about tenants a lot. Um, I suppose there's two parts to this question you know how are tenants going to hear about the, the changes but also how will tenants kind of communicate with you how will how will you hear from tenants yeah great question 
So I think in terms of how tenants hear about the changes, we are being as proactive as we can as a regulator um, in talking to tenants, in, in reaching out to, to tenants. Uh, we've spoken to, to quite literally thousands of tenants during this change programme, um, some of which is facilitated through providers. So sometimes providers will ask us to come and talk to a tenant group or something like that. We'll do that. Um, we've had we've done some work facilitated through um, sector bodies as well, like place shapers and others, where they will facilitate um, a session with us and we'll go and talk to tenants. We've done meet the regulator events. We'll keep doing things like that. Uh, so we want to speak to tenants. We want to reach out to tenants. And I think I talked about the tenant satisfaction measure consultation. We did an awful lot of outreach work around that, sharing that with tenants, talking to tenants, that kind of thing. I think we need to be realistic. There's 4.4 million social housing homes. We're probably not going to reach all of them, um, you know, and I think certainly not as a regulator directly. Um, and some tenants, probably the vast majority of tenants are, are probably not that bothered about there being a regulator as long as they get the right outcomes on the ground. But I think what we want to do is make sure that we have that open feedback mechanism that tenants know we're there if they need to contact us. So we'll keep doing things like that. And with the tenant satisfaction measures, one of the things we saw was providers having quite innovative ways of sharing that with their tenants to get their tenant feedback as well. So going out and saying the consultation is here, we are happy to talk to you about it. Um, if you want to submit something jointly, like, you know, on behalf of like a group of involved residents or something like that, um, or you can submit individually as well. So we'll keep doing things like that. And we'll definitely want that um, to do more of that. And particularly with the standards consultation as well. I think in terms of how we assess it uh, when it comes to doing assessments and inspections and how we do that, uh, we are working on that at the minute. And we're talking to tenants about how we can do that, because really what we want is something that works for them. I think for us, what we're anticipating is sort of having a range of tools and options. Um, you know, some tenants have told us it would be helpful to have um, something like a survey or something like that, that when we're on site looking at providers, um, they have that. Others have given feedback that actually they just want to know that we're there and that they can come to us and say, at any point, I, there's a problem with my landlord, you should need, you need to be aware of this. We'll think about how to engage with involved residents, maybe some focus groups, that kind of thing. So I think what we'll anticipate is having like a toolbox um, of, of measures that we can use to talk to tenants. We will want some form of tenant involvement, I think, in almost every inspection that we do. We will want it to have credibility with tenants in that way. But also, I mean, I talked about the importance of tenants, um, landlords hearing tenant voice in terms of it being an, an indicator when things are going wrong on the ground. And I think we'll want to have that as an option that tenants can come to us and say, there's something going wrong here. You might want to have a look at it. So making sure that we've got that route will be really important for us. Fantastic. Yeah, it sounds, um, sounds really interesting and, and yeah, really positive changes. So um, thanks, Sandra. Um, well, we, we haven't got any questions um, from, from, from the out there. So um, uh, I will move swiftly on to just say thank you so much, Angela. That was yeah, really interesting and insightful um, presentation. So thanks again for doing that. And thank you for everyone who's joined us today. Um, we really appreciate your, your time. Um, we have recorded the session. So if you do want to watch it again or share it with colleagues, um, you'll get that uh, shortly. Um, you'll also get a survey um, to, to ideally complete um, following the presentation as well. So if you could let us know, you know, any specific feedback, that would be really helpful. Um, I think really that is um, that's us for today. So again, thanks, Angela. Thanks to everyone for joining us and um, have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me.